was particularly interested to, to hear Richard Jones talk about the quite extensive collaboration between the EBRD and uh, Chinese banks and Chinese uh, contractors. Uh, so just a question building on that, maybe first for Konishi san what does it look like with the ADB? Do you have a similar um, level of uh, engagement with Chinese banks, Chinese contractors? Um, and then also for, for, for perhaps both of you, uh, what about the Chinese policy banks? Uh, CDB, Exim Bank, who are probably the most um, significant players in, in Belt and Road. What's the level of engagement between your, your institutions uh, and those banks? We have a communication with the Chinese policy banks. Um, and uh, we know they're active in, in many of the countries where, where we are active. Um, and we even know that uh, we finance the same clients. Um, but, uh, but so far we're not uh, co-financing uh, with them. Um, but we do, we do have a conversation about uh, the approach to financing, the standards, um, and uh, the ways in which we might coordinate and work potentially. Perhaps the problem to build the One Belt, One Road will be to find the bankable project. Konishi San, you, you sort of referred to that before. Would you like to expand on that point? The first century American Silk Road, or even the, you know, the Belt Park, going to the South Asia to the Central Asia. Now, so far, they already have identified, you know, at least you know, as an idea, the pro you know, proposals was 66 billion, but you know, they are not even at actually the pre-feasibility study stage. That you know, they want to be in a serious interest among the potential investors or you know, actually even among whatever, the development institutions really to you know, develop such ideas to the bankable projects, then you know, probably the finance. You know, and 20 years forward, will all the boats be going like that by ship or will we finally have reopened the historical trade routes and be putting things on the train? Or will I be able to drive from Beijing to Paris? Um, I mean, if you just look at the volumes of freight being carried by, by sea relative to what could physically be carried by rail, even if the most sophisticated and, uh, and developed system in the world is on the sea, it, it, it's just not even you know, beginning to be possible. Um, so that's the first thing. The other thing is that there are a lot of difficulties. Uh, with this, uh, Some of them are new. Uh, but some of them are more tricky. I mean, there, there are very some tricky bureaucratic and also political questions about customs regulations. Uh, there's also the different gauges between the different uh, uh, railway uh, systems. Um, so um, you know, there's the fact that you know you have to move goods from from, from one, one wagon to, to, to another.
again, the way it would, it would probably be you know, financially or even viable uh, in the development proposals. So the, I really believe that, you know, the, you know, of course, that the air, air traffic you know, would to continue as well. So the Velcro would be supported by multimodal transport, as people talking about, and, you know, all sorts of you know, transport Change of attitude because it's completely different. The risk 
it is faced by the citizenry of one country relative to another. So um, one of the reasons that risk actually arises, I think a, a dominant reason is that the way that labor markets work in most places is that you don't get the option to work just a little bit less. It's either you're in or you're out. And that's a very extreme kind of change for individuals when they experience it in visual. So, you either have a job or you don't. And it, it's not the case that people say, well, why don't you work 75% of the time at the same wage, or 100% of the time and 75% of the wage. Those are not options that are typically available to people. So disruptions in the economic environment to people matter very profoundly because of, of how concentrated the, the, the difficulties that they face are. So when you see a country like the United States move in the direction of tariffs, or any country, my own sense is that it's trying to solve an insurance problem in a way that is somehow feasible for it to solve. Now, there may be other ways of doing it, and the economists I would urge most societies to look for the other ways of doing that, but I think that's sort of the root cause of this, which is that, that a, a, a very rich country and a then relatively poor country opened up and began to trade with each other. The trade almost it's almost necessarily had to be between um, manufacturing from the poorer country and services potentially from the richer one. But the richer one, services are hard to export in general. They serve the kinds of services that are easily exported. So the fact that the US and, and China have this particular trade pattern, to me personally, seems very, very unsurprising. And even if it were very unbalanced, has a sort of normative connotation, which I actually don't particularly share. And in this case, that is exactly kind of what I was expecting from the trade relationship. But I think the root cause is, is the anxiety in the United States among a subgroup of people who are competing more directly on the manufacturing side shows up in the form of protection. And I think that's my. Is China lending too much money abroad? What we were looking at earlier in the presentation of sinus here. Chinese banks have seen a five-fold increase in their foreign lending in the last five years. 500% up. In the same period, EU banks have gone up 5%. The US has gone up 13%. Chinese banks lending overseas have gone up 500%. $630 billion. Shouldn't we worry? <laughs> Actually, 他们不愿意去这个方向通过开始国家开发银行等等这些东西
，因为我们支持委委内瑞拉，他应该是可能是五百亿美元，但是我们没有给委内瑞拉，给他的钱政策的体制太少。我们非洲很多国家，我们也没有要求非洲国家的政府你必须是这个公众号认同贡献，没有，包括印度也这样。我们印度也也也有很多的方向，没有提并没有政府提条件，必须要求政府发发完发表，没有这样的政府。所以我觉得，呃，对，这样如果你了解了这个国际贸易的融资规则，你就这不会再问这样的问题，说中国投的钱是不是太多？因为中国现在也是市场化的一个一个一个国度。那么我们的，实际上我们现在是对对海外的投资，我们是是是要要控制的、嗯。比如说现在我们对埃塞，过去我们很多企业对埃塞俄比亚很多都去埃塞去投资，建了很多铁路啊、呃、水坝呀、啊，包括电缆呀。但是现在这几个月，埃塞已经发布了违约。现在我们对很多埃塞的项目已经开始进行控制，主要是从风险角度。比如中巴走廊项目，我们建了，现在有十二个电厂。如果你建了很多的电厂，他们又输电线路，建了电厂的电也卖不出。这样你会看到，我们现在对安，这个安呃巴巴基斯坦的电厂项目，我们的电厂投资，这个市场上也开始，由于它的违约问题啊，因为它的对巴基斯坦债务问题担心，企业自然就会就会就会控制很多。所以我觉得，我们从这个。呃，官方促进这个融资这个角度来看，分享，也不一定正确。